On the 83rd episode of Passion in Progress, we're talking business strategies that solve problems with Talia Toha. Talia is a business advisor that's worked with media and brands like Home Business, Business First, The Huffington Post, Reader's Digest, Avita, and Buffalo Wild Wings. In this podcast, we get into topics like how to answer an interview question when you don't even know the answer. And so essentially you'll just say, wow, I've actually never encountered that, uh, that question before. What about that question that you found interesting? I would love to look into it some more. The beneficial business strategy of asking yourself more how come questions rather than how to questions, right? And giving some specific examples of why some businesses thrive while others will fade away. Apple and the team behind Apple got invited to rebrand and restructure JCPenney. If you do get value out of this podcast, all I ask is that you share an episode with a friend. It really helps me out and grows what I'm doing here on the Passion and Progress show. You can tag me at Javier Mercedes X on whatever social platform you choose to use. With all that out of the way, let's get into the 83rd episode of the Passion and Progress show. What is up, Mercedes? Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion and Progress show where we talk to inspiring individuals and hopefully through hearing their stories, you too are motivated to go out and pursue your passions. And we are here with Talia Toha. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, you did. You what got it. Up? You nailed all it. Right. <laughs> You're a business advisor, correct? So go ahead and give us a little bit of your background. Advising. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and just a little bit about myself. I mean, I came here as a first generation immigrant mm-hmm. and my family, I grew up in Indonesia. And actually, this is a good number of years ago, maybe 15 years ago now. We had a civil unrest that was happening in my home country where I grew up. And it was just getting really unsafe. There was rioting and pillaging and raping. And it got to a point where my parents had to make this really difficult decision of, okay, what do we do next as far as your education, as far as where we want to live? And so that whole process was, I'm making a long story short, obviously, the whole process was probably about two months, two months long, well, maybe three months And so they did finally decide, okay, maybe you should look into going to school in the States. So we made the really hard decision of basically separating and my parents stayed behind in Indonesia. And I went ahead and had went to boarding school. We were blessed to have the means to do that. But it was still it was still tricky. Right. I Mm -hmm. mean, you're this weird, awkward, shy, skinny teenager, pimply, you know, and you just kind of you didn't fit in to begin with. Right. And when I got there, I could understand some English, but I couldn't really speak it well. Right. I couldn't really express myself. I felt like I had to be somebody else. And also at the same time, you know, of course, I had to deal with the academics, making new friends. And I I was essentially stripped off of all of the skill set that I had coming to the States and then having to essentially learn everything from zero. Right. So it was almost like the ground zero for me to start going, Okay, well, what do I do here? Like, what do I do now? How can I make this as great of a situation as possible? So that's actually when I started all of these mindset shifts that's now super popular. I started there just kind of testing, okay, if I do this, if I look at things this way or that way, what happens? How come when I ask these questions to other people, this is what happens? So all of those things, and I'm so thankful actually now looking back to it that that's how it came about because to this day, I mean, that's how I got to um, work with people that I, I now work with. I got to advise for national brands. I got to work with all these amazing entrepreneurs. And it all just started from just that willingness and almost not so much being forced to do those things, but an invitation to look at your life differently. You know what I mean? So, so that's actually where it all started. So now when I talk about business strategies, I always, always encourage people to start with what are the problems that we need to solve and not so, and maybe the not so obvious things, right? If most people are looking into maybe growing their business or whatever, scaling, get more audience, get more clients, all these things. And a lot of times we, what do we do? We go to like our computer and we type something in and on comes this list of, you know, 10 how to's and all these things. Nothing wrong with that. But then the question that we need to ask is, okay, are we really asking the right questions here? Are we asking questions that provide this sort of macro look into what can actually solve problems that 
don't actually get solved, but need to get solved. You know what I mean? So those are some of the kind of the process that I typically go through when I work with somebody and, and, and um, look into what we can do to grow their business. So that's kind of the long story medium about how I came about, which is really something that, again, like I said, I was thankful for. And now it's just, it's my thing. Like now I just, I just do it. So yeah, that, that uh, started out in a very dark place. You're yeah. Talking about, like, everything and yeah. I like how your energy was there. And then I was like, well, this is how I started. Mm-hmm. When you approach clients, what's one of the first things that you ask? Because it sounds to me that it's more about the why and what they're doing um, than a specific this is the task that you have to get done. And I know it's a case by case basis. So I don't know if there's any particulars that you'd be able to give or um, any examples, but it sounds uh, like a very smart strategy when you are looking to problem solve something. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I think whenever we look into something, like I said, it's always, we always tend to default into doing something that we think would be the solution right when in fact we really need to be asking questions on the front end of it on the kind of the question side of it rather than the answer side of it so a story that i actually ran into which is this is funny just a couple days ago i read this article about how there's this man who came out of maybe his office or i can't remember now maybe he was shopping but he went to his car and he discovered that okay i left my car and my cell phone Um, I'm sorry, I left my key and my cell phone in the car um, and I locked myself out, right? And so, of course, we've all been there. We left keys here and there, right? So we can relate. And it's it's just that moment of panic when he decided, okay, well, what do I do now? This is really not great because I can't get home if I even get to call my wife. My wife doesn't have a car. So he goes through this mental exercise of what do I do now? But he was fixated on... I need to get my wife out here, but she can't get here. So one car goes by, nobody stops, right? Second car goes by, nobody stopped. Third car goes by, still nobody stopped. And then on came this guy who was riding on his bicycle. And it wasn't like a motorbike, you know, it was a bicycle, bicycle, right? Two wheel bicycle. And it was a teenager and he said, hey, what's going on? And so the guy said, well, he explained the whole thing. This is what happened. I can't get my wife out here. She has the extra extra key. Nobody's stopping. I can't call anybody, even if I call her with your phone. So anyway, the, the teenager then looked at him, looked at the car, looked at the keys and the phone in the car and went, well, why don't I just, you know, pick it up from your house? And so the guy went, well, that's odd because wh- you're on your bike. It's seven miles out and back. It's, it's going to take you too long. And the teenager went, okay, well, that's fine. No worries. I'll just do it. So he went, picked up the key, the key from the wife and gave it to the, to the man. And the man was just thankful, obviously. Not only was it just a random act of kindness, but it was also sort of one of those things that you were surprised someone was willing to do, right? So one of I think what really surprised me about that story was aside from the obvious kindness and act of hustle, right? We all talk about hustle. There are a few things that's happening there, right? Like what's what's one of the things that you noticed about um, you know what that man was was thinking of? He was thinking of just one track. I want to do this, right? I want to do X. This is the solution, and how do I get to that solution? But the teenager came and looked at the thing, looked at the situation from a 30,000 viewpoint and just kind of went, well, of course it's not ideal, but I can do this. I can give you this solution. So it's really just the the question of asking more how come questions rather than how to questions, right? And so when somebody comes to me with um, a question or, hey, I need to get more clients, I have an interview or whatever, I have this big meeting and I want to impress them or whatever, and I want to establish this business relationship, what are the things that I need to say? And before we even touch that, we really need to look at, okay, well, let's start from, you know, the let's not just reverse engineer, but really think about why we're engineering it a certain way and and think about not the problem as a problem, but really think of 
whether we're looking at the problem the right way, right? Um, so again, I tend to direct people to ask how come questions rather than how to questions. How come you have this issue or this gap in you know your maybe portfolio? Let's say that you're trying to submit a portfolio to a company, and how come they have been working with all of these su supposedly great artists or creative, you know, content creators, or whatever, and yet they're not getting the result that they're wanting. They're still looking for somebody to fill in those shoes. There's got to be something, right? So I always encourage people to dig deeper. And it's kind of almost the uh, avoiding the trap that Apple, I remember this story as well. At one point um, before Apple got huge, right, became really, really big, they, and I use this example because everybody knows Apple, mm -hmm. but they essentially created the Apple store, right? And they have that genius bar, they have this amazing customer experience and you get to pay the point of sales is just moving with everybody in the staff that's kind of constantly checking in on you. Amazing, right? And so Apple and the team behind Apple got invited to rebrand and restructure JCPenney, which is now, as we all know, kind of a sort of a, an aging brand, sort yeah. of not quite there anymore, right? And so, of course, that team went, okay, absolutely, we know what works. This is a proven model. This is what we're going to do. And they came up with three things. They came up with, okay, instead of JCPenney, we're going to rebrand it to JCP and make this cool little logo that's modern and clean and just really engaging, right, to the millennials and 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 newer, I guess, younger customers. And then the second thing that they want to do was, okay, when customers come into the store, instead of looking at categories and sportswear formal wear we're going to be essentially having different sections for different names and different boutiques and brands levi's got this corner sephora's got this other corner and the third thing that they said that they're going to do is we're going to cut out all of the discounts okay we're just going to keep it retail it sounds we're so much like <laughs> apple <laughs> <laughs> so apple right and what happened nothing happened there's no transformation that happened right N no newcomers then came running to towards jc penny and it obviously there might be other variables of commerce that's involved in everything but really what happened there was that we're trying to implement yes a proven strategy a proven method but we're not really addressing the real problems and maybe non-problems, right, to the specific customers. So even at any scale, right, whether you're this big, giant, multi-million dollar company or you're a sol solopreneur producing your own content, whatever it is, that's an exercise that we got to do because it just it makes you stand out in, in such a a better way because you're doing the things that nobody else is willing to do and a lot of people will just kind of cut and paste certain models cut and paste certain how to's cut and paste certain strategies or techniques without actually addressing the question so when you again going back to that example of let's say that you want to establish a new business relationship the question that you got to ask is, okay, have I done enough pre-work and post-work in between that time when you're, you know, one-on-one -on -one with that person? Because it, I mean, yes, you have the game day or what have you, right? When you're actually presenting your whatever portfolio, you're sending that particular email. But really, what are some of the pre-work that you've done? You know, have you really give, make, made it so easy for them to be like, yeah, absolutely, like, come on in, right? So it's just those acts of... Um, uh, looking carefully into what you need to do before and after that starts from the other person in mind. Yeah. And I know there's one thing that you told me about before this interview where it's how to answer an interview question when you don't know the answer to it. Do you yeah. want to talk? I think this leads into that concept. What do you want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of times when we're in an interview in a client interview and they're face to face with you, a lot of times we're our thinking is we want to impress, right? We need to do great and they want to say yes and what are the you know the the body language that we got to do forget about all that the only i mean the reason why you're in that interview um or in that call or in that email exchange is because they already think that there's something interesting here they just want to see if you're cool 
right? There's yeah. the, <laughs> if you, wow, <laughs> they want to know if there's somebody that you want to hang out with. Exactly. Okay. They just want to see if you're cool. A very, very easy <laughs> concept to grasp. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So the thing, w- the thing that always surprised me is that when somebody on the other side throws you a question that was clearly obviously maybe there is an interest to uh, to make you answer that properly but clearly it's one of those interview questions that you're like well i don't know you know even if i prepare for it i don't have the 10 years of experience and it shouldn't stop you from going to that interview so what what happens when somebody asks you like a question that you've never ever thought about answering before oh, on this podcast i always like, <laughs> i'm very sure i always am like i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> I but know. i would love to know more so let's yeah. talk about it yeah yeah <laughs> so that's actually that's actually exactly where where you sh- you're supposed to start right mm-hmm. the i don't know and the truth trumps all things they want to know if you can tell the truth and still be confident in front of them and and say it in a way that make them want to work with you some more, right? Mm-hmm. So really for me, what I've seen work with a lot of people that I've observed and you know all these amazing CEOs or even just people who are just starting out is that they essentially answer it in three parts, right? And I'll, I'll give you an example and it's really common. And if you hear it, you'll notice that you've actually heard these, question, uh, these answers before, but we'll break it down in a second. So essentially you'll just say, wow, I've actually never encountered that, uh, that question before. What about that question that you found interesting? I would love to look into it some more. And that is it, that is it. So you essentially, you use the first part to say, okay, great point i never thought about that and i have not thought about it because and you can weave in if you want to make it longer if you're comfortable to make that answer longer weave in the fact that because i've been so focused on this other project or whatever and that's been my specialty great right just a reminder for them to kind of point back to why you haven't been working on that but you've been you know working on this other thing and then the middle part is essentially okay so in inquiry right okay what about it i want to know more about why you asked that question it wasn't like okay here's the question and then i'm going to think about some flowery answer that i can come up with and they know right like when when you start answering things in in a roundabout way they they can smell it and if they're an expert in their field and they have this difficult question they know the difference between you know real answers or not so don't bs them obviously and just kind of move on and What's more important though, you need to close with that uh, question, the open-ended question of, okay, what about it? What can I do to find out more about it? Um, And actually follow up afterwards, you know? And that's kind of what I talk about. I I call this kind of the bookend strategy where not just the beginning, but also the end where you follow up in a way that's really high touch and high level. And it's not just, hey, checking in, hey, following up. Hey, what do you think, right? Um, what do you think about my email? It, so none of that. Just kind of each time you you contact them, whatever it is, you need to have something that um, that's uh, that shows them that hey, he's he's already a top performer. He's already a player who's really willing to play. Um, so that's really it, and it just becomes seamless, and it just bridges. What that does is essentially it bridges your I don't know over to let's talk more about it. So your answer was actually completely spot on, <laughs> maybe just kind of re- reframe it in that way, right? So mm-hmm. um, so that's, and I think that's actually, interestingly, when you come into, you know, in contact with your client or your potential client, uh, they already know, right? Like I said, that your whatever your credentials are, whether you can probably do the work or not. They just want to, like I said, not just know whether you're cool or not, and they want to hang out with you. But also, well, how do you handle questions like that? Because at some point, if they're working for you, or if you're working for them, then um, you need to be able to to kind of uh, figure out how to how to handle that types of situations when you're not you, when you don't know these things. So. Um, and there are other things as well that that uh, I always like to point out. I think the the mistake that we often do is that we tend to prepare for to make the marketing look pretty. You know, we tend to to make the packaging look pretty, resume, um, even you know, videos and podcasts. We do all of that, but we don't really ask. Okay, well, why should anybody? even open it why should everybody even look at anybody even look at it Um, and if they've already been provided the solution of 
okay, this is this is the solution to your problem, then you need to be able to kind of give give it a different spin or give it something that's fresh, a new look and um, an alternative solution. Right. And that that's essentially what will make you get into the door no matter what, you know. Um, so and I, I find it interesting now because with what we all do, we're always kind of counting counts and downloads and views and followers and subscribers. And I love it actually, when I look at some videos and I read some emails, I love it when people end with questions that make me go, huh, that's, that's actually real interesting. I didn't know that that was, you know, that that would be something that makes, makes a big difference, you know? So even just questions that, um, you know, instead of hit subscribe, you know, instead of just hit subscribe and follow for more, why don't you ask how about you subscribe so that you don't have to stress about this other thing and I can give you the entertainment right as you're walking out the door to the metro, to the subway. You gotcha. know, just kind of get get really in the mindset of where are they when they're looking at your video? And <laughs> then- the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need so entertainment I while you're on the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> I bet you, if, you if, if you're that kind of content, mm -hmm. I bet you people would go, uh, would totally, Yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so it's just kind of that, um, y you know, mindset of, OK, we really need to be on the eye to eye in almost everything. Right. So it's fun. It's fun. And, and I totally encourage anybody to to try those those things out for sure. Yeah, this is interesting how I can loop this in to the interview question, how you answered it. When I left my full time job at the Chive being a video editor, um, I got approached by Apple to be a uh, on their video editing team uh, here in Austin. Oh, and wow. during the interview, this, this is really bad, really bad. Uh, <laughs> during the interview, I was talking about my so my YouTube channel is all about Adobe Premiere Pro. And that's a video editing software. And this whole time we're talking, having a great conversation. And at the end of it, I was like, so what do you guys, are you guys on Premiere Pro? What do you guys use to uh, do your video editing? And the guy just was silent. And then I had to think there and I was like, oh no, <laughs> Apple has their own video editing <laughs> platform and it's called Final Cut Pro. And he, he let me answer it for him, but I had to completely own up to it and just say, look, you guys are probably on Final Cut, aren't you? He's like, yes, we're on <laughs> Final Cut. And then I was straight up with him. I was like, look, I know the theories behind video editing, but I don't know anything about Final Cut. So uh, even after that, it was a great conversation and everything. But obviously, right now, I'm pursuing YouTube, this podcast, and all that kind of stuff. That is so true. did they ever get back to you, or was that? So here's another thing, too. He, him, the person that was doing the hiring, uh, when he reached out, I told him straight up and said, look, I just left my other job to pursue doing my own creative entrepreneurship, um, pursuing YouTube, this podcast, and... I definitely want to take on freelance video work in that capacity because I got to pay the bills <laughs> yeah. um, during while I'm building this up. But I have to give my chance or I have to give myself a chance to grow and learn this space myself. And he was completely uh, all for it. Obviously, he had to build out his team, but it was good to have a mutual understanding of like, hey, I know I could go in there and really help you guys out, but I also am being authentic in the way of telling you that I don't know my longevity of if I were to take on this job, where that would be like, because I know I just left my other job. Yeah. And if my mindset is always on like, man, I, w I wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen. So <laughs> I was just like, nope, I'm going to see what happens. Um, and that was like a year and some change ago. And I don't know what they're doing now, but I I think that's hilarious uh, that, that happened. Yeah, yeah, I think when you're approaching those conversations, just to be as authentic as possible. I will say though, it does help when you are way experienced in oh, whatever, whenever the, the topic is. Yeah. I know going into that interview, it was like, oh cool, this is Apple. I wanna see what they have to say. But in terms of going into that interview, it, I knew whatever the position was, if whenever he talked about it, if it would be a good fit for me or not. 
and if it would be pushing um, my capabilities as an editor and me growing as a person, or is this just another job that I'm taking to be as another job? And uh, in terms of when I heard what the job was about, it was like, oh, there's definitely potential to grow here. And I knew that it was going to be a fit. Um, I don't know if it's as much of good advice in my situation, because I knew when I was going into that situation, I knew that I could do that job. But if somebody's right. like really looking to push themselves, I don't, I don't know. Right. I don't know. No, I think, I think that's actually a great point. Cause I think in any, when you're looking at opportunities, right. You're, yeah. you're not just gauging the opportunity, but you're also gauging what you can do to meet that opportunity. Right. And it's at a scale of whatever, one to 10, obviously if you're a 10, and that's something that you love to do, that's an opportunity. Now, if you're a one and that's something that you want to do, then a way to look at it is, okay, well, you have to kind of set your set yourself some guidelines, not rules, but just guidelines and just for yourself as to, okay, how long do I want to try this out? Like, is this something that's worthwhile? Because if I take, it takes me two years to learn this, then you know, I could be doing this other thing. So it's kind of, obviously it's a personal, you know, check and balance that you got to kind of go through in pros and cons, worst case and best case scenarios. But um, I do think that if you're like a, a four or five, you're kind of somewhere in the middle of the road as far as how uh, good of a fit you are to that particular opportunity, that's actually when you can really stand out. Because some people who are tens already for that particular job, don't have the hustle right they don't yeah. mm -hmm. they don't have the hustle maybe they're slightly overqualified so people who are looking at you know freelancers and I, I tell you one experience actually this is interesting that you mentioned this and this just happened recently I went to one of those third party you know design uh, contest mm -hmm. platforms right yeah. for for a particular project that I wanted to do and and there are levels right there's like a the, the an entry level artist that can pitch you their work, their medium level, mid level, and then their their top levels. And what I noticed was the the entry levels. Obviously, their artwork was not up to par just quite yet, right? And there are some hustlers in that entry level that if you give them just more time, they'll do probably what you need them to do. But it's really the mid level ones that really push the boundaries because they have enough skill set to kind of go, okay, I really can do something. I can try something out here. You know, you're a little bit more daring in trying certain things out. The top level artists are, they, they kind of look down on certain things, right? They're like, no, I'm not going to do X unless I'm guaranteed work or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you think about your, um, your peers, people who are doing the same thing as you, it's not a bad idea to kind of test out different different platforms and different um, opportunities because what happens is sometimes the people who are qualified, there's a top level actually who pitched me their work and that's it, like no communication whatsoever, no explanation as to what and I asked them, okay, hey, can you make these adjustments and nothing, but it was this like mid, I wanna say he's probably in kind of a mid to top level so he's kind of a, like a six or seven right and he was on it he gave me like to every question that i asked him he addressed every single one gave me scenarios that is enough for me to go oh, okay these are all the options without and this is probably important for creatives without ever losing his voice and artistic touch that's what i really wanted that's an intangible that asset. is so <laughs> tough because you have this you have something so unique that people who want to work with you don't have right whether it's a signature style whether it's your energy whether it's your editing skills whatever it is and and if you lose that because the the question that gets asked of you makes you go well maybe they want something completely different then you know maybe that's that's not for you because there were people who kind of submitted their work afterwards um with me giving them the same question that i asked this other this guy the mid to top level and they completely changed their design and i was i just got so confused i was really hoping for okay i like your style can we can we do it so that it's it's you know just slightly modified like that whatever right um and the the person who won the design was, you know, the person who were able to kind of submit 20 different pitches and yet still have that unique touch that 
um, that I couldn't get from anyone else. So I would think that, yeah, absolutely to your point, if you're looking at business opportunities, if you're looking at projects, that's definitely something that you want to gauge. If you feel like you're entry level at this particular project, you know, maybe go where you're mid level, right? Mid to top level. Um, but if you feel like you're entry level and you really are a genius at that, yeah, absolutely go try it out, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that gauging that often probably gets entrepreneurs a little sidetracked, especially in the beginning of their careers. But it's worth kind of stopping the extra maybe five minutes and thinking, okay, where am I, where am I on this and where are they on this and how can we kind of you know, meet and not just in the middle, but kind of meet to make this really work. So there's a question I have on that when since you're on the other end of creatives interacting with you, when I send out emails, when I get revisions on videos, a lot of what I like to do is just let the work speak for itself. So if prime example of this is say I just put together a video for a client, client gives me, all right, can we switch this, 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 this and this. So my next email to them is here's the video and then i don't want there's only so much other copy or text that i want to put along with it because in my mind i'm thinking they're just going to watch the video and if they don't have the same opinion or they don't get the same thought process as i did from watching it there is what's the point of me writing it down because i don't want to taint their vision of what i think whatever the video should be. I think that the product in and of itself should speak for itself when you present it to the client again and again and again. Now, obviously, there's some caveats there. It's like if you're on a huge project and the client says something to you and then you're like, OK, we haven't had time to get music for this for this video. By the way, type, 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 there's no music in this cut, but here is the here's the bare bones of it. But in most circumstances, what I like to do is just send revisions as is and then just say, here's the link, <laughs> watch it and yeah. then like tell me what you think. What, what would your opinion be on that? So I would think that it probably depends on the client, yeah. right? And probably depends on your relationship with the client, mm -hmm. right? So if you've worked with them a number of times and they kind of get you, yeah. They kind of get your style. Hey, Javier is doing this and this is really his personal touch. It's probably OK to just go ahead and send the link because there's enough kind of, um, you know, establish unsaid relationship yeah. things that, that they can kind of, OK, we got it. OK, but if you're just starting out, if you're pitching somebody cold, if you're, you know, you're pitching for a job or a gig or whatever it is then I would say at least at the bare minimum, provide like bullet bullet points that address okay. their questions. Right? If, it's, if it's pitching somebody, I, that's a completely different ball game. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. Uh, pitching in ball game. I yeah, I totally. That. So <laughs> and I kind of I kind of yeah, I like that. that's a really nice catch. Yeah, it took me a couple of seconds there. But I, I like to equate that actually with how you know, when authors and writers work on their books, a lot of times they actually separate the process. They have a writing process where they just kind of essentially brain dump all of their, and maybe they have an outline, they, they brain dump. And then they have a separate process for editing. So I would actually equate your journey and process with the client as, okay, where am I on this? Like, where where am I exactly with, with this person or this yeah. company or whatever it is? And um, I think and I come from a family with artistic background and I get it. You know, my my sister is an artist and she's actually a, a visual arts major and all that. So she's like a hardcore, like real, not even applied arts. Right. Mm -hmm. And consistently she would say, I don't want to have to explain my art. And I totally understand it because, yes, absolutely. But that's exactly why you're the genius. Right. You're the genius who masterfully created this amazing thing for people to to understand and unless there are critics and people who are constantly like you know making notes and like reviewing your work it's usually pretty hard for just laymen people and clients on the other side to understand exactly the thought process mm -hmm. right so um i would say that as a general rule if they have specific questions right and requests then in your revision it, video or link or whatever just go bullet point it and just be like on that question, this is what I tried out. 
Um, I could tr try option B, I haven't, but let me know if you need to, right? And go like three bullet points or whatever it is and easy. So you don't have to like go into this prose and, and story about why this is it. And I think that's kind of, uh, people don't want to read that anyway. People have like three minutes to really look at things these days, maybe at most more like, more like three seconds. Right. So, yeah. yeah so especially with videos and that's why a lot of the videos up these days are really, really short. And um, so, yeah, just the goods, you know, just the goods. Maybe if you feel like there are highlights in your revision, then you go, OK, at whatever, 0041 or whatever it is. You know, this is what, why we did and I, why we did this and we changed it up. So I would say because a video is a story, right, you have to be able to at least at minimum explain that three bullet point of the beginning, middle and end. And our brain just works that way, right? Even on short little snippets of memes and things, like it needs to be able with, within that time frame, whatever that is, to uh, have a beginning and a middle and an end. So that would be my recommendation. As a consumer of content for all the content creators that listen and also just the creative entrepreneurs that make their marketing materials and everything, what's the biggest piece of advice that you can give? Oh, okay. So there's probably quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, fit it into five minutes. <laughs> okay. um, so I actually, I think nowadays, the cleaner and the simpler, definitely the better. I, I, I really, really, now I just don't like to look at things that's more than, like I said, you know, five minutes. I just, that 20 minute is too long. It's just not, now it's different if we're doing podcasts, right? You're listening. You know what you're getting into if you click yeah. on it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So um, A is definitely keep it nice and short. And which means that you got to put your best work out there right off the bat, right? Don't, I think there's a, a presumption that you have to build up to something, right? You have to build up to something thing when you're creating content whether you're blogging or vlogging or you know creating video i i would say yes if you are doing longer you know pieces of content but if you're doing things that are shorts you know pithy and just real gems and things that they can go huh that's really interesting and it just kind of catches their attention um i i would say just put your best foot forward up front so whether that's the cooler music or you know really cap image that's really captivating up front and that go what the hell and just make them kind of tune in some more um don't save it till the end because i i see that often where people would save like the good stuff in like a little thing like a little um corner and i'm like well why why would you do that you know i can't find i have to look for it and there is this concept uh, in um consumer consumerism where you you essentially have um, uh, you know, yeah, there's a three minute fish brain where, mm -hmm. <laughs> where if you don't get it in within three minutes, you're, you know, they'll click out. Right. Yeah. And, um, it's probably this, getting even smaller now. It's probably mm. getting you know, three seconds, <laughs> Yeah. you know, and I talk about this as well. Um, as far as, you know, um, a lot of, uh, when I used to, uh, when I advise for retailers, like big brands, they have this thing that they call, um, the Vista, you know, so when you first walk into a store, you look at this grand kind of road just middle of the road and then it it leads to this disney castle right like the the vista that you want them to kind of see immediately right off the bat but the trick is how do you make that vista clear that they can intuitively just go okay i'm gonna go to the right here and then just kind of follow along and it's almost like you're guiding the experience and i think that's the challenge that a lot of content creators right now is faced with Sometimes they would just focus on, okay, this is the title, this is the subject line, and then they kind of, you know, kind of not do such a great job on the content, right? Mm -hmm. Not so much, right? The first paragraph needs to be so catchy and so compelling. It almost needs to be kind of a summary of what you're trying to say or what you're trying to create. Um, and it's, it's, I think that's the point of a trailer. I think that's the point of, you know, when you look at videos, sometimes the opening scene is, is you know, this, this chase scene, you know, just something that really grabs the attention. And it doesn't have to be loud or this mega scene or the most expensive scene. It just has to be, make them kind of stop and look back and go, that's okay. That gets me thinking a little bit. What, what else? What's, what's more, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And and I think that's different for everybody. Every yeah. content creator obviously has their own theme to it. So I mean, what do you think as far as as far as? Oh yeah, so perfect. A perfect example of this is my best performing video on my YouTube channel. A lot of the comments that I get on it is they say thank you so much for putting. It's a tutorial, and they say thank you so much for putting the uh, how to do the tutorial within the first five seconds of the Absolutely. video. Yeah. And then I actually was enticed to stay for the rest of the video. And I'm not just saying this is like one comment. This I get this maybe like once a month on that video. Somebody says something like that. So I think that's a clear and concise, ex- perfect example of exactly what you're talking about. And completely different in terms of like it's not a chase scene or anything like that, but it is what the content is about. In the very first um, couple seconds, which I try and do and copy and paste that method with all my videos now and just say, hey, this is what this video is about. If you don't, if that's not what you were thinking, then you can click <laughs> you away can now. Click but yeah. hopefully you're here to stay. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think that's really important. So I'm glad that you point that out. Um, and you also have a podcast coming out. Where can people find that and where can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. So all of the good details and I have a free gift actually for your, you know, for, for your what? audience. This yeah, is amazing. Just something real quick, some cheat mm-hmm. sheet, you know, all mm-hmm. the good stuff for Javier. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really just something that you can take for the next time you're thinking about reaching out to your people and maybe for client to clients and things like that. Um, that way you can have something handy. It's the top two, what I call top two reaching out pearls and um, it's going to be on my website goodgrowgreat.com slash pip passion process uh, <laughs> progress so yeah. it's it's um so you can find and it's going to be in your url I'm yep yeah yeah include. i'll okay. put it there perfect yeah so that there you go yeah awesome yeah well there you go uh and then what's your podcast about so it's going to be predominantly business strategies and it's going to talk about things that i have talked about just over here And more so, though, I'd like to kind of keep it really short, 10 minutes long every day and essentially snippets of what I learned as far as growth solving, as far as, um, you know, solving for things that's not immediately obvious in your business. And I would look at articles. I would look at blogs. I would look at I would listen to podcasts and all of these resources. Obviously, I'll have experts there as well. And um, hopefully it's useful to you guys. I love that. I love that you want to keep it short and concise and it's daily, man. That's that's a, quite the task. Quite the task. Well, cool. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. I mm-hmm. love uh, being here. Yeah. And until next episode, don't forget to share this out on your favorite platform or you, what you could do is write out the link. You could put out JavierMercedes.com on a parcel, mail it to your grandmother and say, you should check out this episode. That would be amazing. And please tag me at Javier Mercedes X on Instagram. I'm going to keep saying that until somebody does it. Uh, Until next show, I love you guys. And I hope you are out there living a life of abundance.